Now it's time for Global Insight, where we speak to experts from around the world on issues making headlines. Over the last two years of the COVID-19 pandemic, many people around the world have been rather confused by conflicting messages and measures by authorities. Seeking out the voice of reason, truth and logic, societies have been turning to scientists. Now, Professor uh, Devi Schroeder is at the University of Edinburgh's Medical School and she holds a personal chair in global public health. She also found, she's also a founding director of the Global Health Governance Programme. Now, Professor Schroeder, she's been a leading figure in the fight against the coronavirus as an advisor to governments around the world and a trusted voice in global media. And most recently, her commentaries have been making headlines here in South Korea, and we're very honoured to have her on our programme today. Thank you for Welcome, having me. Welcome, Professor Shrida. Well, you made, uh, you've attracted quite a fan base here in South Korea after you wrote about how the Seoul model was an exemplary response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So, first of all, if I may, what made it stand out to you? Well, I think if we go back to right to the start, January 2020, South Korea was one of the first countries to recognize the threat COVID-19 would present and to start building diagnostic capacity, building up testing, you know, drawing on the tracing and the isolation facilities that had been thought about for MERS. And so it was one of the first countries to start running, trying to contain this without using a harsh stay-at-home lockdown or some of the draconian measures that China had used. And I think there was already recognition, we've got to keep the economy open, let people have freedoms and liberties in a democracy, but also find ways to control COVID because the threat was clear of what it could do to health systems. Despite 90% of the country's adult population having been vaccinated here in South Korea, the number of people contracting COVID has been hitting record highs every day here. What would you advise as the way forward for South Korea and of course other countries that are facing the same kind of situation? Well, the first thing I would say is congratulations to South Korea for managing almost two years into this pandemic for keeping the case numbers and deaths so low, you know, buying time for vaccination to very similar levels, even higher than um, European and British countries, but without the loss of life that we took over those two years. But on the other side, I think what we're seeing now with the new variants is even if you're fully vaccinated, even triple vaccinated, you can still get COVID-19. And so I think we will expect this to circulate. And the question then is, does it result in severe disease and death, which is what we're trying to avoid. So if people can get COVID-19, be fully vaccinated, and let's say have a mild illness and then recover, then we'd say vaccines have succeeded. We've avoided the severe illness and deaths. And I think right now, so far, it seems vaccines are doing that. And so that's the message to people, which is you might get COVID-19, but vaccines have blunted the health impact they would have had had you gotten it, let's say, in a pre-vaccine era. You have a new book coming out. It's called Preventable. That's going to be hitting bookshelves in May. It focuses on how global politics shapes public health. Now, what is one major change you would like to see among global decision makers the next time that we face a global health crisis? Yeah, no, I'm excited for the book coming out. And actually, the prologue focuses on South Korea and the experience of MERS and kind of how that was built upon for the SARS-CoV-2 response. And I do have a whole chapter actually looking at South Korea in January and February and comparing what was happening there versus what was happening in the United States and Britain at exactly the same time. And I think, you know, the real lesson coming, um, which I bring to near the end of the book, is that this is going to happen more regularly. We are going to have more outbreaks and diseases that have pandemic potential. But just because they have the potential doesn't mean that they have to become pandemics similar to what SARS-CoV-2 has become. And you see such a myriad of responses across the world if you look at COVID-19 of what countries try to do with this virus. And the hope is in the future they can be more coordination, even over something like travel rules, where countries say, OK, we're all going to follow pre-departure testing, or we're all going to have similar quarantine procedures versus what we have now, which is every country just doing its own thing on its own time scale, sometimes within countries, look at Germany, 16 different regions doing all something different. And it's very confusing and in some way it undermines other countries' actions because we're all doing different things. So the hope is G7 leaders have recognized this, G20 leaders have recognized this, that there needs to be a more coherent approach, which is just because you're in Spain doesn't mean you should be doing something different to us in Britain compared to South Korea. It's just been right now, really a every country's doing something different and when you look back at them a month later it looks completely different so that's we've seen just hasn't worked against this virus 
How should governments support and work with scientists from the initial stage of the pandemic? Yeah, so this has been a fascinating time to be a scientist because people are thinking scientists are taking over the world, they have too much power. And the thing I keep explaining is actually the power is still with political leaders. It's with ministers, it's with prime ministers and presidents. And what scientists can do is just outline scenarios. So when this came arose in January and February, I think all leaders were given similar options. They were told, you need to let it flow through, reach some kind of herd immunity, everyone needs to get it. They were told, go for elimination, find every case, take it away. They were told control, wait for a vaccine or a treatment, some kind of solution. And then a political decision was taken at that point of, actually, what do we want to do? How do we balance the economy versus health versus people's individual rights and liberties versus the harms of this virus? How do we message clearly? And so I think as a scientist, even today, we can advise and say on public health, this is what we think. But it's up to leaders to put that next to economic concerns, human rights concerns, climate change concerns. We had a huge climate conference in Scotland in the middle of the pandemic with tens of thousands of people. That's up to the leadership to say, OK, I hear my public health scientist, but I'm also hearing my climate scientist and my economic advisor. And now how, how do I assimilate that data and then make a decision? And Professor, you've emphasised how the infection cases that we talk about every day are actual people, are family, friends and neighbours, they're not just numbers. In what ways have we overlooked people and who have been the most disadvantaged? Well, I think what's been interesting is my sense of South Korea has been you haven't had the debates that we had early on. So early on here, we had debates over should we just let sacrifice the old for the young, just let old people die for younger people. Do people who have cancer, do their lives matter less? I've been on debates on mainstream TV saying, well, if you have stage three cancer, should you just say, well, my life matters more than someone who's healthy? And so I think there's been a lot of kind of weighting of who is valuable in society. And when people die, the question being, oh, did they have underlying conditions? Because if they did, then it was OK. And if they didn't, uh oh, without realizing that underlying conditions with COVID can mean being overweight, having asthma, having hypertension, being a cancer survivor, um, having high blood pressure, having heart issues. And if you look at how many people that is, it's a huge amount at a population level and many people we know. And so I think it had been better from the start to say, we're in this together. We're gonna try to protect life overall, control numbers, because the big surprise, let's say in Britain for people and the United States is that this can also kill you if you're unvaccinated and under 50 and you're healthy. Our ICUs are full of people and, uh, who are under 40, who are fit and healthy, who thought they would be fine, didn't get the vaccine and then end up in hospital because some of the messaging here in Britain has been, oh, it's just like the flu. You should just get it. It's harmless if you're young. And that has undermined that public health messaging of this being a serious virus. And we've had to try to reverse that, say to people, even if you're 20 or 30, you know, you need to get vaccinated. And even if you look at the United States, I mean, 50,000 COVID deaths are in under 50s. This is also a serious virus, even if you're young. So this whole idea of young versus old was false. And unfortunately, we wasted a lot of time on that instead of saying, I guess, like South Korea, how do we contain this and not let anybody get infected, not by locking people away, but actually by using other infection control measures, masks, asking people to avoid crowds, using selective lockdowns and the testing and tracing systems and the isolation facilities that mean that infectious people are not out, you know, infecting others. The WHO has said that Omicron seems to have a growth advantage compared to the more deadly Delta variant then could the spread of the Marder Omicron actually kill off Delta, or is that just wishful thinking? Well, I think first that Omicron will overtake Delta. In the UK, it's projected in the next two weeks because it was so widely seeded. And though we've only found hundreds of confirmed cases, the idea is there's thousands out there that are not being found because of the sequencing limitations. So I think it'll definitely become dominant across the world. Will it result in less severe disease? I don't think we know enough yet. There is data from South Africa that people had shorter stays in hospitals, but the age profile is different, I think, to what we have in Britain or I think what you have in South Korea. And we know that age is related to severity of disease in terms of how long do you stay in hospital. And so I think we just don't know yet. And it is a gamble to hope that this is much milder. 
And what we were saying, that even if it is milder, given it's more transmissible, you'll have more people infected. And we know it does translate to hospitalizations. There is not a complete broken link between cases and hospitalizations, though it's weakened, which means your health systems and your hospitals get pretty full. So in two to three weeks in Britain, if we don't see a slowing in infection rates, we are in trouble in our hospitals because we just won't have enough beds. And that's the problem, even if it's a bit less severe, if it's more transmissible, unless it's really all the way like a common cold, but those are not the signs yet that it's gone all the way to kind of something quite innocuous. Now, this pandemic is stretching on a lot longer than many predicted in the initial stages of the virus. Now, how has this virus surprised you or changed your views as a scientist? Um, so I think when this first emerged in early, early January, we're watching it. And then by mid-January 2020, I think we knew this is gonna be everywhere because we had seen the Chinese government struggle to manage it without very harsh measures. And that was a strong state. So think of all the places in the world that don't have that kind of state overreach, you know, to be able to control people and their movements in that way. And I think what surprised me is less about the virus itself. It's been more about the responses to it. And I think the complacency of the Western world, which is also why I wanted to write the book because Britain and the States were seen as the two leaders in public health preparedness and pandemic response. You know, we were the scientists that other countries looked to and said, oh, how are you preparing for your outbreaks and what are the systems you use and the data systems? And we now are at two you know, years in and you look at the death toll of the United States, it's probably gonna hit a million in the next few months, a million people. Can you imagine at the start of that? And here in Britain, we're gonna hit 200,000 deaths, I would guess in the couple next, you know, the coming weeks. And so I think there's real questions to be asked, not just about the virus, because we could have anticipated a highly infectious respiratory virus that spreads quickly. And thankfully, unlike MERS, it doesn't kill as many people. Um, and um, it can have milder infection in many people. But despite that, we've still fumbled, I think, in our response here. And there's a lot of questions and to be asked about how do we do better next time? Because you know, even here today, there's a big dissonance between what the government is saying what society is thinking. Masks became a hugely political issue. So you saw in the United States, if you're a Democrat, you wear a mask everywhere. Even if you're outside in the forest by yourself, you wear a mask. If you're a Republican, you're indoor in a crowded arena with thousands of people, you don't wear a mask. And here in Britain, you're starting to see differences between England, where they said no more masks first, you know, we're done with this. Then you saw Labour wearing masks in the House of Commons and Tories not wearing masks. And then in Scotland, we've just kept masks and tried to keep it not political and say, if you give people the choice to wear it, it becomes symbolism. I'm wearing a mask because I'm a certain political affiliation instead of it being a public health tool, which is that's how the virus spreads. And you wear a mask not to infect others and you wear it in certain situations and not in others, similar as how you would do it for any infection control procedure. So. I think that's also surprised me, just masks and how angry it seems to have made people. I mean, we have had mask protests, like people showing up to protest against a mask. And I'm thinking it's a piece of cloth or paper you wear on your face to not infect others and not get infected. It's a tool, but it's become very heated to say anything about masks. And next year is going to mark the third year of the coronavirus pandemic. And Many are worrying that it's going to be yet another year of mass boosters and uncertainty. Is there anything that we can be more optimistic about? Well, there's a huge amount to be optimistic about. If you think back to last year, to where we are today, we have safe and effective vaccines. We have really high take up of those vaccines and they do seem to protect against severe disease. So many people will survive this pandemic that wouldn't have survived had vaccines not arrived. It has saved millions of lives already and it will continue to do that. Therapeutics, there's a new Pfizer and Merck antiviral pill that seems to help reduce the severity of illness. We know there's better and better clinical therapies as doctors understand what kind of cocktails they can give to patients. Plus the testing, I think the real transformative thing has been the home testing where people can test at home with rapid antigen tests, know if they are infectious and then not go into let's say social events or crowded spaces and that has helped. There are ways to manage this. They're not perfect ways, but they're better than we had at the start. If we go back to the start of January 2020, most people didn't think we'd even have a vaccine or any solution. And I think those countries that bought time that said, well, maybe something's coming. Let's control infections. Let's not be fatalistic. And we're all going to get it yet. Then have managed to vaccinate to such a high level. And 
to wait for better therapies and ways to treat people. And so, yes, at some point, probably all of us will have to be exposed to this. If I look at the coming years and months, depending where you live here in Britain, I mean, the virus is like one in 60 people have it. So it's circulating quite actively. So even as careful as you can be, it's still difficult to avoid it. Um, you know, the real choice I say to people is to get vaccinated and be exposed and hopefully have a mild illness or be asymptomatic or to not get vaccinated and get it and risk having very severe illness. And that's a good choice that we have that people have the option now of being protected and having better options if they do end up in hospital. Thank you very much for that. Professor Devi Shruda, uh, Professor at the University of Edinburgh Medical School. Thank you again so much for your time today. It was an honour to have you on our programme. Thank you and best wishes to all of you there as well. Thank you.